Welcome back to Your Average Witch, where we talk about witch life, witch stories, and sometimes a little witchcraft. In this episode, you meet Leslie, a witch living in New York. She tells the story of how her family left Europe to escape religious persecution, talks about a visit from a beloved spirit, and introduces her to her dog, Sprocket. Now you'll probably notice some sound issues. Leslie had some technical issues with her mic, but I promise you'll enjoy this interview as she had some really wonderful and insightful things to say about witches and witchcraft today. Now let's get to the stories. Hi, Leslie. Thanks for being on the show. Hello, Kim. How are you doing? I'm suffering greatly from Mercury retrograde, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. So I actually didn't even realize that was happening until I saw this uh, meme on Facebook. Uh, It said, like, uh, here it is. Mercury, Saturn, Pluto, Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter are all in retrograde at the same time. And then it's like the guy from Batman, the words are, like, on his back. And then there's a little... The little guy in pink from Willy Wonka that says, me with some shiny rocks in my underwear, affinity for chaos. Seriously. (laughs) And it's kicking my ass. Yeah, I did wake up this morning feeling, I I mean, you know, considering everything I just went through the last two weeks, I was like, is this all of that? Or is it some of this retrograde stupidity? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Would you please introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are and what you do and where they can find you? Yes. Okay. So my name is Leslie and I am the co-host of a podcast that's been running for three years called Living Dead Girls. Uh, And we are a true crime and paranormal, but also generally spooky podcast. So we will cover taboo topics, topics. Strange, unusual, missing cases, uh, cryptids, um, hauntings, and um, I don't know, we like decided to do it because there wasn't a lot of uh, local related podcasts doing that, and so a lot of our content, I would say about 50% of it tends to be New York related. Uh, you can find our podcast on pretty much all platforms. When we first started, there was no such thing as Apple Podcasts. It was just called iTunes. So it, you, we're on Apple Podcasts slash iTunes. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Podcast Addict. I think we're on iHeartRadio. And then uh, you can email us at Living Dead Girls Podcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook, which, eh. After three years, we still have, like, no reach, which is sad, but it's Facebook, so I'm not surprised. But on Instagram, we're pretty active. We have a decent following and a lot of engagement, which we've worked very hard to tweak over the years. Um, My podcast co-host's name is Kat. Uh, She tends to do most of the paranormal, spooky, uh, haunting stuff. Uh, I lean more into the true crime side. We refer to ourselves as murder paranerdos. Um, because our podcast dad, that's our friend Patrick, who uh, actually helped us get started. He has a show called The Big Sands. So I call myself a murderino, which came from the podcast My Favorite Murder, um, which actually came from The Simpsons, which is even funnier. And Kat calls herself a paranerd. It's like the paranormal community. So Patrick is like, I don't know, y'all. He's Southern, by the way. I I don't know, y'all. You should really just call yourself murder paranerdos. So that is literally now on our um, on our merch. It's like we have makeup bags that we sell. And it says like murder paranoia on the back. We have T-shirts and patches, and yeah, we've got we've got close to three to four thousand solid listeners. It took three years to get there. We do live shows. Um, we're about to do a big live show at the Witches Ball here in Buffalo. Um, only because they made rules for COVID safety. But we also did a live show a couple weeks ago at a tiny little coffee house, trying to get back to feeling like normal again with some of this. But I don't know. What is normal anymore? I give up. Um, And then just in real life, I'm a social worker. I work with the homeless population. I help homeless people get stably housed and get their medical care, their mental health care. I help them kind of, you know, establish themselves again and uh generally just not being paid enough to save the world as always so yeah yeah 
That's me. I live in Buffalo, New York. I'm going to try even harder to get you to Anna Hutta's purpose next year now that I know all this stuff. Oh, yeah. I could have brought on for five minutes, but I'm like, eh, I'm just going to cut it nice and short. There you go. Let's see. We did a spirit box and you should have been there. <laughs> oh, that would have been amazing. Oh, my God. My friend Patrick would have loved that. He's done. He brings. OK, he, the amount of people that he brings on his show is insane. Um, he just had David Kirshner, the man who like wrote and created Hocus Pocus on his oh. show. Which was mind blowing, but he's also had like a lot of very well known people connected to the psychic medium community, and he had the woman, the daughter of the Perone family. They were the ones that owned the farmhouse that was uh, the you know the house in the movie series The Conjuring. Yeah. So Andrew for sale now <laughs> yeah for like a couple million dollars or whatever right so like but andrea andrea perone has been on his show um he's had like a lot of different writers producers and been dying to tell you about this i have to send you a link he had an a th- author on his show name I'm, i hope i don't slaughter his last name it's like vincent higginbotham and uh vincent wrote a book called how witchcraft saved my life uh Ooh. and i read it during this pandemic and i am not gonna lie it definitely helped me he is very honest about doing shadow work and stop doing the whole toxic positivity thing and being honest about your pain and your struggles and facing that and, and, and talking about it so that you're putting, you're putting intention into dealing with it. His book is so good and it's a little bit workbook, workbook, a little bit spell book, a little bit storybook. Um, but Vincent's book, uh, I, I found him and I added him on Facebook and uh, we've talked since then, and we are going to try to get him on our show. But in the meantime, he was on Patrick's show, The Big Sands. Um, and if you want to learn about that book, they talked about it in depth. But I have to tell you, it's not not to. I know some witchcraft books are very intimidating because they're very thick and heavy. This is a small, easy to read book um, that will really, if you're going through a hard time, trauma. He talks a lot about trauma. This is the book for you. It is so incredibly well done. So yeah, had to add that. There are so many weird things happening in my life right now that make this even weirder. <laughs> Join the club. Join the club. There is so many weird synchronicities. <laughs> mm-hmm. What does it mean to you when you call yourself a witch? So uh, when I was younger, uh, it meant... Um, I was punk rock and I didn't want to be like anybody else, but it also meant that like I was going to wear all black and I was going to wear a big old pentacle and I was going to be intimidating because I was bucking against the major world religions. Then in my twenties, I, I don't know, I had a shift. I went to Salem uh, and I actually went to Salem consequently as a result of that almost every year for about 15 years. Uh, and I met Lori Cabot and I met several other witches and I realized two really important things. One was I couldn't identify with the word Wicca or Wiccan for my own personal reasons. It's just something I can't connect to anymore. I don't connect to neo-paganism very much and I f- have feelings on the word Wicca that may or may not offend other people. So I don't want to do that. But it was that moment when I went. You know what witch really means to me? It means that I am t- I take control of my life and my energy and I practice on how to use it for my betterment and the betterment of others and that I understand and acknowledge that there is more to the world than just what we see around us in basic everyday life. I'm kind of a I'm kind of an agnostic witch, so I don't have anything specific I I worship or that I uh, celebrate specifically, but I do acknowledge that there is something bigger than all of us. And that as a witch, I have the, I have the privilege of connecting to that if I allow myself to. Hmm. Do you have any daily practices? And if so, will you share them with us? I do. And I hope this doesn't make people laugh because this is definitely, 
It definitely makes people laugh when I tell them. So I discovered this book. It's it's called like The Secrets of Happiness. And it's a, it was written by a Danish author who studies happiness. And it's called Hoogie or Hoogie, 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 H-Y-G-G-H-Y-Y-G-E. And I have incorporated some of the Hugue traditions. This is not a witchcraft book. This is the Danish people love comfort. They basically worship comfort. They Their lives revolve around being comfortable, certain kinds of lighting, enjoying really good food, warm, fuzzy sweaters, being casual. You know, they have things that they love that make that, you know, little treats, things like that. I have learned to incorporate having like a very hoogie, hoogie uh, morning, which is I allow myself to wake up and kind of sit and think about things that are going to be ahead of me for the day. But I use essential oils. Um, I have a company that I buy from that I've been buying from for like way over a decade that I really trust. Some of them are actually considered uh, root work oils, practice uh, for root work. And I have st- I've studied root work for a very long time. Um, and I always have to preface this by saying I am a white cisgender woman. Uh, it is not my tradition to co-opt or take control of, or really even talk about in any kind of extensive way. But I did take a correspondence class years ago um, to learn, and I have incorporated those uh, oils and that meditative uh, intentional work that goes with those oils. So most mornings I will use healing oil just to kind of help heal my head from a, a long night of sleep, because sleep isn't always restful. Sometimes sleep is a mess you know and it nightmares and sleep disturbances and things especially during this pandemic um sometimes i will use crown of success uh because i have to go to work and i want to get my head in a place where i will be able to do my job i will sometimes use oh uh forward so forward is like a you know move forward put the past behind you and just look forward and i just take a time i take a time to like anoint myself and do some thoughtful intention work so that I can try to go into my day without too much of the remnants of the night or the day before dragging me along. Because when I don't, I have found that I do drag those things along with me and I can't get a good clear head. And it's made a huge difference in my world. Huge. So yeah, that's my daily practice. I always feel like I suck at this. <laughs> But I ask that question and people have such thoughtful responses and I'm like, well, I brush my teeth. <laughs> oh, I mean, I do all that too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's not fun though. That's just stuff I have to do. So. <laughs> do you have any family history with witchcraft? I do. Uh, and it is deep. So I'm not going to talk about this for three hours. I'm going to give people the opportunity to go online and do a little research because they will be glad they did. So my grandmother's side of the family is all Polish. And many generations back, my family fled from a town in Poland called Dorochow. They fled from that town because there was uh, the witch trials and the witch hunts were happening in Poland. My grandmother's family did I find, identify as witches, but it was not a word they used. They used the word Zarwonica. And so Zarwonica was Polish witch, but also meant, just like in Salem, it meant you were kind of doing your own thing. You were into herbs. You were into practicing healing. You were into song and chant and music to help people feel better you were a comforter you were a midwife you were an elder and you provided like what they would think would be like mental health counseling back in the day just by sitting and speaking with someone but the witch hunt did not care Uh, it was partially financial because they wanted people's property and it was partially sexist because they hated women and it was partially the fear of the unknown because everybody was so Christian and other um, we're talking like, you know, European Christian or whatever it was they identified. So my family fled, they did make it. They did spend most of their time traveling for a very long time. You know, I've gotten away from the G word because it does not apply to my family so much. And unfortunately people have, 
made it into an even worse word than it, I, it should ever have been. So I prefer to use the word traveler. My family were travelers. They were very nomadic. And so I was born of a family of witches and I am still a witch. And I actually identify as Zeronica, Polish witch, but just witch with a capital W is usually more than enough for the average person. So yeah, but that's my family history. It's very scary and sad. If you Google witchcraft trials Poland, Durochow, uh, actually witchcraft Poland will probably bring up Durochow. Um, I can never remember how to spell it because I am, I don't speak very good Polish. I, that's my one regret in life is, um, I wish I would have learned Polish from my grandmother. She did try, but I was a stub, very stubborn child. When you were growing up, did you like, did you have a family? Did, did you do witchcraft like as a family? Uh, yes, in very small ways we did, because when my family settled here, they were afraid that they would be ostracized or treated like they were in Poland. So they settled into Polonia, the Polish neighborhood here in Western New York, and they started going to church. And just like so many people, uh, you know, people of color and people who occupied Africa and other areas when they were taken as slaves... They wanted to take kudu with them, um, but they could not because their white slave owners were all Christian. So they hid their religion and their beliefs underneath Christian symbology and Christian uh, visuals. And so my grandmother did the same thing. They hid a lot of our witchy practices underneath old school Polish practices. Um, so we did. You know, we would make certain types of foods for certain holidays. Those actually were Polish, but they had a whole other intention. We would, um, um, in the winters, we would burn certain things because we were taught that there was a release in burning certain things. Uh, I witnessed my grandmother uh, putting a cur curse on someone <laughs> once um, because he was a very terrible person and my mother being very mad that she did that. And they did not really tell me what was happening until I was about 15 years old. And that was the day that my grandmother gave me a scattered pile of pages that were supposed to be in what I guess Wiccans would call a book of shadows. And my mother gave me hers and now mine are in my book. All of that's in my book. And that we have, I have family spells and concoctions that have been handed down for many, many generations. We did, we did definitely did practice. Yes. That's like a dream. The passed yeah. down part. It was book. very, yes. And I was a mess because it was in a book and it all fell apart and it continued to fall apart as people moved. And my grandmother wound up, do you remember back in the day, like everybody was into like that plastic canvas needlepoint crap yeah. that came up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My grandmother basically used that to create a binder for oh, all no. of the because she, you know, didn't know how else to do it. She also created one for my family tree, which she was handwriting for like 50 years in her little like granny writing in partially in English and partially in Polish. So, <laughs> but it's still in that plastic needlepoint stuff. And I laugh because it's hilarious. Like we, I look at it and I chuckle because and I'll take a picture of it for you and you'll laugh so hard, but Plus my grandmother, she, that was her way of trying to save those papers. So, so what was your first experience where you chose to do witchcraft? So I was about 18 and I was just finishing high school and I, I did not have a good high school experience as many people did. I was bullied a lot and made fun of a lot. And I, because the other half of my family is Jewish, I was subjected to a lot of anti-Semitism and a lot of uh, hatred. So upon leaving, upon my last week of school, oh my God, so many people are probably going to like think this woman is out of her mind. I had a bully in school who really wreaked havoc on my life and many others. So I made, um, according to uh, a spell, a, a concoction in my grandmother's book, I made a bottle of what was like a spell water. And it was, you know, I won't get into the ingredients because these are kind of ancient Chinese secrets slash family things. Although yeah. I probably didn't say Chinese. That's probably totally inappropriate. But you know what I'm saying? This is top secret. Nothing gross. 
It's just all intentional herbal work and oil work. Uh, made it in a bottle, and I'll never forget it. It was like a crappy old olive oil bottle that my mother was saving for God only knows what, and I washed it out and filled it up and took it in my backpack. I filled a bucket of water <laughs> in the janitorial closet at work, or I mean at school. I dumped it into that, and when we were on our recess outside in the summer, outside of the school, I dumped the bucket of water over her head. <laughs> um she wound up not graduating uh she actually didn't pass her classes and did not graduate and she was kind of shunned by the school i don't necessarily chalk it up to the spell work Uh, i do chalk it up to her just being at see you next tuesday to everybody and their mother um i i do take some credit for the spell work because I was in the spell, it said, upon using this, you know, on the person, um, to their knowledge, it was not meant to be hidden, because a lot of spell work is kind of done quietly, because you don't want people to know, um, for whatever reason, Uh, but this was, you had to anoint them and let them know, and when I anointed her and said, you know, it was basically like a, it was like Gandalf, like, you shall not pass, kind of thing, (laughs) like, going forward, you will not go with me anywhere you'll be gone and as of today your your history she looked like carrie from when they dumped the the blood over her in the scene from carrie she just was like oh my god what just <laughs> happened what just happened you know, so, so yes, that was my first real uh spell work and the best part was i didn't get in any trouble she didn't report me. Nobody reported me. And I had the luxury of telling my mother me like a couple years later so I wouldn't get grounded because I was too old to get grounded at that point. So, yep. Hmm. <laughs> now my story is out there. <laughs> I know it's even sadder, just to add this as a side note, in the middle of this fucking pandemic, my best friend from high school texted me and said, hey, did you know that so-and-so died? And I'm like, what? And it turned out she, turned out she died. She actually had a very serious problem with uppers and downers. She was taking a lot of Xanax and then a lot of the downside of that. And she overdosed and died. And this was just like maybe like five, five or six months ago. Yeah. Jeez. I don't think she led a very good life. I think she led the life of a very... A tormented person. I think the way she treated other people followed her everywhere she went. So, yeah. I don't think that had anything to do with my spell because my spell had no death or harm intentions. It was that I'm washing you out of my life. So what would you say is your, when you think about all the things you've done, what is your best experience with witchcraft? I went to Salem every year for a very long time. And I would always meet up with people from certain parts of the pagan community there i would participate in the the Samhain parade um i highly recommend anybody that's trying to connect to a community but maybe doesn't have their own to spend a couple days in salem especially during october the community is, is like they're they're a lot of them are pretty decent people i had the pleasure of connecting with Larry Cabot's daughters. I used to make, and I still do occasionally, I used to have a business where I made fairy wings and fairy horns and all these things. And I would make many, many pairs and then I would deliver them to Salem because Lori was one of my biggest customers. And I remember one time I went to the shop and her assistant at the time said, I think his name was Nathan. He said, Lori would really like to see you. And I said, oh, sure. Like, isn't she busy? Because the woman at that time was doing, like, spiritual readings and tarot readings for, like, very famous people, including, like, the lead singer from, uh, what was it, from Gavin Rossdale from Bush. Like, she was reading for him. She was, like, reading for uh, the guy from Godsmack, who I guess was kind of involved with her daughter um she was reading people were flying into salem just for her so i thought oh i mean she doesn't have to make time for me so she pulled me in her office this is this is literally probably my greatest experience with witchcraft ever because as i said i'm a healthy skeptic about a lot of things my mother had just passed away about a year before that and 
there was really no internet. There was no Facebook. There was like barely live journal. There was stupid MySpace. I did not tell a lot of people outside of Buffalo that my mother had died. And I definitely did not tell Lori Cabot or the people that worked the, at the Cat, the Crow, and the Crown, which was her store at the time. And I went in the store and they said, Lori wants to see you. So I said, okay. So I like brought, brought back into her like parlor, which was like, amazing um and she sat me down and she said you've been making these wings for me for a really long time and they've made a lot of people very happy and they bring a certain energy to halloween and to Samhain. and i just want to let you know how happy I, they've made me and i said oh that's great like and she would hang them in the store as decoration it was really fun but she said but i i, I pay you in money but i never do anything else I just pay you in money and I said that I mean that's the deal like you know <laughs> to pay my rent with money but she's like I really like to get I really like to give you a reading and I said oh okay sure I thought that'd be like a tarot reading but it was not it was like going to Lilydale which I also live right near and getting like a reading and she closed her eyes and she said things feel different than when you were here last year she said there are people with you. Somebody's here with you. I said, yeah, I, my partner is with me. Um, we drive. No, she said, no, there's somebody here in this room with you. And they look a lot like you. Who is this? Is this, is this something, did something bad happen? And of course, this was the time of John Edwards. So I was like, hmm, I don't know. You tell me, did something bad happen? Like, I'm not going <laughs> to feed into the fishing. And she goes, Leslie, your mother is here. Did your mother pass away? And I said, how do you know that's my mother? She closed her eyes again and she described my mother perfectly to a T. And then she said, your mother wants me to tell you that she is really sorry that she can't be there with you and that she feels bad. And I fell to pieces. I fell to pieces because my mother died very suddenly uh, and it was very traumatizing. And I said, oh, I, there's no reason for anybody to feel bad. Like I was really in shock. I didn't know what to say. And she goes, but she wants you to know that she feels she's given you enough for you to go forward and do things that she wanted you to do, that she was teaching you to do, and that you need to speak with your grandmother. And I said, because this is the saddest part is I had to tell my grandmother that her daughter died, which was like one of the worst, most traumatic things in my whole life. And I said, can I ask her a question? Can you please ask her what I'm supposed to do with myself without my mother? Like, how do I was really angry. Um, and Lori said, your mother says that you are stronger than she thought you would ever be at this age. And that you will go on to do great things, but that you can't lose sight of that. And you can't let her being gone convince you that this is the end because she isn't gone. And that trip to Salem was the hardest trip of my life because I had other customers to meet with. I had events to go to while I was there and I had to now carry on like that never happened. So for the rest of the trip, I kept feeling like my mother was with me and following me and I had the luxury of having to go home and talk to my grandmother which was really hard so I went home and I went to my grandmother's nursing home where she was living and I tried to talk to her and I knew she wouldn't think I was crazy because you know I was raised in some form of which uh, lifestyle and my my grandmother before I could say much more she goes oh your mother's already told me I've already spoken with her <laughs> and I said well what could she have said she said that some lady said that she was going to send a message and and that you were supposed to come pass it but I've your mom's already talked to me wow and I said oh okay so I guess we need to have some conversations, Grandma. And I only had a few months left of those very deeply uh, intentional, magical conversations with my grandmother until she passed away in March, only a few months later. Uh, but she did 
hand things down to me that were not, I was not supposed to actually be told until there's a timeline of this stuff in, in certain families. They only want you to know certain things at certain ages. Um, it's kind of like the developmental process. Like they assume that you won't be able to quite process it until you're this age or you're this age, but they kind of gave me the crash course. And my, I'll never forget my grandmother saying, your mother is very stubborn, just like I am, and she will never leave. So she will be with you the rest of your life, and you will see her if you look for her. So if you don't look for her or you deny this, you won't. But if you look for her, you will see her. And I didn't really look for a while because I was kind of afraid. And then my mother made it very clear that she needed me to look for her. Uh, I was doing my laundry in the basement of my old house where my mother used to live. And I still have this. I have a sign that my mother made that she used to put on her desk because the desk was in our laundry room in the basement. I it was like her partially her art workshop. Uh, and I was a terrible teenager. I used to throw all of my laundry on her desk and then and fold it. Maybe, maybe she put a sign on the desk that says, do not put things on this desk. And she put it on the desk with great intention. Well, that couple of weeks later, I was home doing the laundry and I threw a bunch of stuff on the desk. And then I realized that sign was there. And I said, okay, I'm just going to take this stuff off the desk. But I was really upset because looking at that sign was really hard. So I put the sign very respectfully facing down. And then I finished my laundry and I turned around and the sign was standing back up again. Mm. So to me, I don't even consider that paranormal. I consider that witches. I consider that witch family, witch magic. It's not a spell. It's not an intention. It's not a bunch of herbs or a cauldron. It's a, this is your witch family, like tapping at a mic going, is this thing on? Tap, tap, tap. Hello. So that is really, that was, and ever since then, I have made my efforts to make her a part of my everyday life so that she knows that I know she's there. So, yep, that is, to me, that is actual witchcraft. Do you ever deal with imposter syndrome? I do not. And this is something I struggle with because Kat and I just had this very long conversation about the other day and I realized I've never experienced it. Um, I guess because I know my strengths and my weaknesses. And even though I doubt myself, sometimes I don't ever get so far into th that area I do not I and I listen to other people's stories and read their stories and I'm I read them from a standpoint of of a mental health professional and a caseworker too that I'm like gosh I wish I could help you that's terrible like that you can't you don't think you're good enough or you don't think you're doing this or what I, you know I feel bad but no I, I really haven't I've had self-doubt and had to sit down and take a nap to try to shake it <laughs> off, but I've, I, I have not, I don't know. Maybe I'm lucky in that way. Yeah. I, I think nothing helps things get shook off quite like a nap. I think a nap is like magic into itself. It allows you to just turn your brain off and shut things off for a little while and reset yourself. If you can, if you have the capabilities of doing that, but yeah, no, I've never had imposter syndrome. Well, what would you say is your base, your biggest struggle with your craft? Or your practice that I don't know what's happened in the last few years. We're going to talk about this on a future episode. I feel I'm constantly being bombarded by people that are now atheist or secular humanist. And I actually had to just end a friendship with someone that was one of the most painful endings ever because I got so tired of basically being told People who believe in these things are stupid, that spirit, supernatural stuff is not real, that we make thing, these things up because we have other mental health problems that we're using to cover these. We're using this to cover those up, which like, you know what? I, I don't know why people even talk like that other than their own insecurities um, and probably some drop of transmis tra transmission, no, uh, transgression of their own issues and jealousy. I guess I'm just tired of fighting the fight of having to tell people just because you don't believe and that's fine. I don't need anybody to believe in anything. Actually, I don't really care, but I'm tired of having to hear the dismissive crap uh, that goes with people going, Oh, you're a witch. Oh, 
what does that mean? Like, you know, that's just movies and fairy tales and stuff, which is why I actually picked up Vincent's book um, because I kind of needed to hear from another witch um, immediately. I don't know why people are like that. I've got, I, I respect atheism and I used to work for a secular humanist organization and I respected that. I have like a huge respect for Sasha Sagan. That's Carl Sagan's daughter. She has written some great books. She would never, ever to do that to people and dismiss their beliefs. So, yeah, like I, that's a struggle. And I don't know why it's getting worse. It's getting worse and worse. I have a lot of say, friends who are Satanists, mostly the Temple of Satan. I know they dismiss all of that. They don't believe in anything magical, supernatural, ghosts, witchcraft, magic. They don't believe in any of that. But they don't make me feel bad. So it's the people that go out of their way to make me feel bad or try to, as my mother would call it, take my magic away from me uh, that I struggle with. I've got to learn to learn better boundaries. I've got to learn to believe in myself and what I do for when these people open their mouths, which I am very, very, very over. So that's the current struggle. What do you most want out of your practice? So I'm getting older. And uh, I'm, I think differently than I did when I was younger. So what do I want for my practice? I look, I look to witchcraft now to serve me on a protective level, to continue to get stronger in protecting me from the things that hurt me, to teach me ways to heal myself uh, emotionally and spiritually. And again, Vincent talks a lot about this in this book about doing your shadow work and acknowledging your trauma or even your generational trauma. Uh, I practice a trauma informed approach in my practice of uh, my career. I look to witchcraft to carry me through from my one chapter to my next, because I'm heading towards 50 now. And I, I view 50 as a new chapter and I don't, I think, I need my practice to keep me going forward and evolving. So I guess the answer is really to help me with better boundaries, to protect me, to serve me in my next chapter, to help me embrace my age, um, to help me understand that, you know, youth and all of that is not forever, but the next chapter will be its own type of beauty. I think that's the one thing witchcraft is that makes me so proud to be a witch is that witchcraft wants you to embrace your whole life one chapter at a time it wants that's why the mother maiden crone thing exists i i don't necessarily agree with it because not everybody is going to be a mother uh and not everybody has the privilege of living to old age and becoming a crone um so i look at it more like maiden warrior crone uh, which is what my 30s to my 50s has definitely been is like my warrior phase i i love that witchcraft celebrates you being you from the beginning until the end and if you use it if you work it it will support you all the way through okay that makes me happy yeah. <laughs> you too can be a warrior i gave up that mother maiden crone stuff a long time ago i got very mad at it because it's a bit transphobic it's a bit turfy Sometimes some of the witchcraft community, some of the Wicca community turns me off when I see that get going. I'm like, look, not every woman has a uterus. Some of them are trans and some have had them removed. So what does that mean? Does that mean that they're not good enough exactly. for that move, exactly. the triple move phase? Like, cut it out. So I just, I, I, that's another reason why I kind of got away from Wicca. Is there a lot of like Wiccan um, forefathers and mothers that, I don't like their mouth at all. Like I got, <laughs> I don't like their mouth at all. No, there are definitely members of the witchcraft slash Wiccan community that I have nothing nice to say about. And I will refrain a couple of them. I mean, are just, I, I look at them with side eye, like you cut it out. What's your fucking problem? Like I just, I studied all of it though, because I needed to know what worked for me and what didn't. I grew up on Scott Cunningham, Silver Raven Wolf, Gerald Gardner, Ray Buckland, uh, Margot Adler, uh, Lori Cabot. I grew up on all these people. And who do I still carry with me? Like, who moves me to, through this all is basically myself. 
and new authors. I appreciate what they gave me and what I learned. I like Scott Cunningham too. He was actually a pretty decent human being too. But I look to the newer authors, the younger authors. Vincent is very openly gay. Uh, he's very openly, he talks about non-binary roles in Wicca or in witchcraft. He talks about um, the resurgence of the, of a gender being a construct in witchcraft. I think we need to lean more towards them. Some of the forefathers, they are just like old cisgender white men that I, it's time for them to not talk anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Done. How about that? How about that? <laughs> How about that? Right there. <laughs> but I won't get angry because I've already had my years of anger towards all of them. I actually threw out a bunch of books because I was like, these aren't even books I want to lend to anybody. Like, just out they go. <laughs> I will lend you great new books. Like, Vincent's book. Um, I do still lend out some of Lori Cabot's books. Like I, my friends call my office a hoarder's den. That's where all my recording equipment is for the podcast, but there's a million books in there too. But those are the books that I've grown to still need and still look at. Uh, none of which are most of those authors that I mentioned. So there's great new authors out there that uh, deserve the attention and are, and just they're what they have to say is just as important as what all these path like forgers had to say in the sixties and the seventies. So what has brought you the most joy either in your practice or in your podcast? Because that's something I'm curious about. Believe it or not, camaraderie, especially with the show. We've had some really great people on the show. We've made very good friends with other people who connect with us and on whatever level. What's brought me the greatest joy, though, really, is that I have learned. I mean, all my life, my mother taught me to I have a voice and to use it. But I've learned I can now use my voice in other ways than sitting on Facebook and yelling at everybody, which clearly does not work. And to learn to make space for the other people that also have voices. I actually only started to learn and get out of a rut the last few years when I started making space to hear other people and what they've had to say and hearing their stories has brought me not only just joy, but a lot of comfort, a lot of comfort knowing it's, I'm not the only one in this. Yeah, that's why I like this doing this because I feel like I'm trying to do that too. Yep, you are. And I commend you because these these conversations need to be had and we need to also, you know, talk but also to listen. What would you say is your biggest motivator in your practice? Probably the fact that I just have days where I feel like I have nothing left. Um I feel very emptied out and squeezed out and spread thin. And sometimes witchcraft is what refills my vessel. And I think it's really important for me to allow that to happen. Um, it's kind of like asking for help, which a lot of people are very bad at. Myself, uh, I've been working on that for a few years now. But you have to be willing to ask and then let it happen. And so that's something that I try to remind myself every single day because Americans just, we're not taught to do that. We're not taught yeah. to bootstrap ask. bootstrap you got a bootstrap yeah positive vibes only oh shut up like just like, <laughs> please i have this one very very hippie friend that's like she's got it on t-shirts and backpacks and a sticker on her car and i'm like does do you find that that actually brings positive vibes only i'm curious i would like a <laughs> like an analytical database study on if that is actually bringing you positive vibes only you know, she thinks I'm a huge bitch when I do that, but whatever. <laughs> whatever, sure. I'm a huge bitch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. That's okay. That's, that's, which stands for woman in total control of herself or himself or even their self. And part of that just means sometimes you just got to be the bitch. Yep. Okay. It's time for the roller coaster ride. What do you dislike? or even hate about the witch community oh. we're gonna come back up so that we can go down with this <laughs> oh, oh where to start uh first of all everybody's got to understand that they don't know everything about everything and they are not the, the control the controlling thing because you wrote a book or you have a show or you have 
had national recognition does not mean you are leading the way for the witches of the world. Like you are a, you are but one grain of sand on a beach of other witches that have been, that have come and gone long before you were born. Uh, that, that stuff's got to stop. A uh, holier than thou stuff is like, if you want to turn me off, that's the way you do it. There is uh, one particular witch out there whose name I will not mention. And then my other biggest issue is the witchcraft community has got to work harder towards accepting people of color, learning yeah. to be more diverse. Witchcraft is such a white thing. It's got to stop. White people did in witchcraft uh, were subjected to hangings and burnings and being chased out of their villages and all that. You think we would know better, but we do not. People of color, also uh, different, you know, ethnicities and traditions, they don't necessarily understand neo paganism in America, and that doesn't mean that what they do is any less important or any less powerful than what goes on here. We should be listening to them. Uh, we got to make room for trans people. We're not making room fast enough for them. It's like at a snail's pace and it's absolutely fucking ridiculous. It's 2021. Um, and we've got to learn to accept that we have to just agree to a disagree on a lot of things. Um, it does because one person's practice doesn't match up or align with yours. Doesn't make it bad. And we've got to stop being fear mongers. I, like I said, I took a lot of time studying hoodoo and voodoo. Um, with the Lucky Mojo people. And if the one thing is I learned is that it is not what you think it is. You have got to learn to stop being or feeding into the fear of what you don't know uh, and go study it. And then that fear will, it'll subside. And then you'll have smarts to go with it because you actually understand what's happening. Like, I, I just, I don't know why the witchcraft community is so generally stubborn. It's very stubborn. I don't know. I just hope as time goes on, we learn to be uh, a potpourri in the cauldron of a little bit of everything. And that we allow everybody to add something to it. Instead of always being about a bunch of old white cisgender people preaching the same stupid things. Like, and no offense, but some of these spell books make me laugh so hard. Like, I I have nothing to say about some of them because they're so bad. Like, you know what's really good when you go to Barnes & Nobles and there's like a 101 little ways to change your life with spell work. Teeny little book you can put in your purse and you open up and the first thing is like a love spell. Okay. Let's, let's not. Could you maybe have made that a spell for clear, mind clarity or doing better or, or helping heal racism or so it had to be a love spell? Really? Okay. Yeah, that's my biggest issue with the, the witchcraft slash Wicca slash, unfortunately, chunks of the pagan community as well. So Now, what do you love about the witchcraft community? Um, I believe that after, after everything that the world has been through these last few years uh, with the pandemic, I'm going to get a, a tiny bit political, but I'm trying to avoid it uh, with our former POS president. Uh, and everything that he brought to the table. Um, I think the witchcraft community has responded very well in the sense that they have tried to work on healing. I think the witchcraft community is a greater whole. Like I said, they're very stubborn. They can be very compartmentalized, but at the same time, I have noticed a very universal energy from one practitioner to another of wanting to heal and make the ground that these things have made so shaky, including this pandemic, try to make the ground stronger. So just imagine if they could all put their heads and their hands together on a more regular, consistent basis. Like, I think they could make some major change. I am very proud of many uh, practitioners that have stepped forward to try and heal. And I also think that they, despite the things we all don't agree on or whatever issues there are, most people in this community understand that intention is everything and that you, they are now, they spend a lot of their time using that intention for the greater good. And I've seen some really beautiful things happen the last few months. Um, you know, of course, like I've also seen people threaten to, you know, curse Donald Trump. There was like a national 
which movement to curse the president, all these things. And I was like, oh, that's great. But I also saw a lot of like calls for national, like across the globe of healing for the country and healing for people and healing for horrible racist things that have happened, healing for, you know, call for prayer and, and justice for George Floyd, for Elijah McClain, for all, all these ho- horrible murders of people of color. I have seen the community try. And 20 years ago, I don't think they would have ever done that. But we also have a very different crowd of which is these days we have millennials and up and comings and uh, people my age that are just, we're are just done. We're not taking it anymore. So I am, yeah. I am very proud. I am proud. I've seen good things. I think we're pretty cool. I think so too. Who would you say are the three biggest influences on your practice? My mother, my grandmother. And um, I have to say it was, it's not a, it's not a person so much as it is a, an energy. It's the energy of group work that is not necessarily a coven. Um, around here, we have a couple of like non-coven witch gatherings. Uh, we have, uh, I have my own, it's called um, Oak and Acorn. Uh, and then we had another one too for a little while. Like we're still trying to get everybody back together because the uh, the pandemic destroyed all like indoor gatherings. So we we're doing some outside fires. But um, Oak and Acorn and Oak and Moon, which is kind of like my witch gathering group, they are a huge inspiration to me. They are eclectic. They are kind. They are open minded. Uh, they are diverse. And they are mindful, which I think is so important. Uh, They picked me up out of a rut when I wasn't sure if I really wanted to do any of this anymore because the pandemic just crushed my soul um, for a lot of things. So that group of people, is they're definitely, they inspire me every day. Very good people. Who would you like to see on the show next to tell stories? I have to tell you, if you reach out to him, I think you could probably get Vincent on your show. And I think you should, he's very accessible. Vincent is very, very accessible. But remember, he's a professional. He's a, he's now become kind of an award-winning author. If you read his Amazon reviews, he's getting some really outstanding reviews. But he's an everyday guy. Um, He's not, he doesn't put himself on a pedestal out of the reach of others. And, you know, if you get his book and you read it, which is, it, like I said, it's short and you could definitely finish it in a day or two. I think it would really be a huge thing for anybody listening and a huge thing for you as well. I plan on getting it, actually, because yeah. it just fits in with all this weird crap that's happening to me. <laughs> oh, it's I'm telling you, I cried. I cried the cry of thank you for finally acknowledging that it is OK that I am fucked up about things right now. Thank you for acknowledging that I am a sexual assault survivor and I don't have to pretend that away with unicorns and fluffy good intentions and good vibes. And thank you for allowing me the permission to let myself explore the dark side of things so that I can shine some light on them. This is my issue with this. Everybody wants, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but certain practitioners are like floof and light and sun and positivity and good intentions and think, and I'm like, but but what about those dark Things times? Happen. Yeah. What about those dark times when you're home by yourself and all you have is your thoughts of trauma and hurt and, and disappointment? What what then? Do you think me lighting a white candle and throwing some glitter at it is gonna make me feel better? Like sometimes you need to talk to the shadow self. Sometimes you need to talk to the shadows in general. I, I do this all the time. This is a regular practice of mine. When I think things are really bad, and they were really bad, uh, the last week has been bad, (laughs) Uh, I will be in my house in the evening, and I tend to keep a kind of dark house because everybody thinks I'm a vampire, so I might as well figure I'll live it, and everybody will think I'm a vampire. Uh, So I live in the dark, kind of. I actually yelled into dark parts of my house and said, listen, I acknowledge that you're dark, and you're there for a reason because the world is balanced. And we can't exist with one or the other. So just know I know you're there. 
and that you won't you won't you're not here to take over you're just here for the natural balance of the world but you will not consume me you will not consume me um and the other thing about that that i think humans are afraid of the darkness they're afraid of the the corners of the their lives that they have forgotten or stuffed away or even haven't explored the fear of the unknown i think that's part of how trauma continues to fester in our every being you have to be willing to look into the darkness and talk to your trauma and not try to pretend it's not there and not pretend it away because it's trauma doesn't go away you reconcile it and you work with it the same way you do with death or loss grief grief doesn't go away it, it, this is it's a it's what is it they say it's not linear it's grief is not linear and so i i i don't know i just I wish better for the world, but there will always be darkness because without it, uh, it would be a really weird place. And when I used to study belly dance, which is actually how you and I met, I remember Carolina telling this story about the lotus flower and how yeah. you go up above the water to receive the nutrients of the light, but then it would go back below the water so it didn't burn out and die and shrivel up from the heat and eat the nutrients and the coolness below in the darkness of the water. So sometimes that darkness exists for a reason. I feel it's like one of the reasons we turn the lights off when we go to bed at night. I feel like it's one of the reasons why we feel good sitting around a candle or a fireplace with darkness kind of surrounding us. I feel that is the very description and the visual of the balance you need. So if I can press anything upon anybody out there, that's it right there is you don't have to erase your darkness. You can shine some light on it and, and, and talk to it, but you do not have to erase it because if you do, you're going to ask for whole new problems. And I don't want to even stop to think what those would be. So there is my, uh, there's my Ted talk for the day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask? Uh, no, I think we covered quite a bit, except for that I would say to anybody who is unsure of their path, because maybe they have convinced themselves they need a path, they need a Pantheon, they need a book, they need a mentor, that you don't have to do that. Your life is going to be... a uh, it's going to be a series of people and things and places. And it would make no sense for it to all revolve around one thing, one person, one concept. I think that is where major organized world religions go very wrong. I think witchcraft gives you the permission to be very eclectic and to take in all the smells and all the visuals and all the words and process it and maybe even create your own practice. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you unstable. Uh, if you need someone else's practice or their books or their stories to get stable, that's fine. But make room for your own little uh, footnotes on what you're going to do when you make your own practice. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's not enough of it. And there is a beauty in creating your own practice and also then sharing it with other people. And now we're at the last two. Things that aren't questions. Okay. <laughs> Please recommend something. It does not have to be witchcraft related in the least. Recommend something. Oh, okay. I totally recommend that book, that audio book I told you about, which I'm sure some people are going to think is crazy. Uh, it's that um, Hoogie book. Let me see if I can get the exact title. I, you'd think I should probably just own it because I listen to it so much, but I listen to it on the library app. It's called The Little Book of Hoogie, Danish Secrets to Happy Living, um, written by and read by Meek Wicking. Um, he's the CEO of Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen. Excellent book. Excellent. Strange. Um, the food section will make you very hungry and very thirsty for things that you probably do not have the time or the energy to make. So maybe you can skip that because I, totally, I was like, <laughs> oh, this pastry he's talking about is oh, killing no. me. I have oh, no, no pastry like that anywhere near me. But I enjoyed the lighting the talks of the lighting and I'm not a big Christmas fan, but I celebrate Yule and he like describes Christmas as the most hoogie holiday, hoogly holiday. Of really? 
because of all the darkness with the soft light and the giving of gifts to people and the camaraderie of food and they love to eat. Danish people love to eat. They love cake. Cake is like their favorite thing in the world. Um, there's a lot of cake in the Christmas hoogie tradition. And but I did I do love that he acknowledges that Christmas can also come with a lot of stress and anxiety and that Christmas can be a huge fail, which I loved so much. I'm like, thank you for saying that. But I love that he just talks about all the things. Some of them are crazy sounding and some of them that will resonate very deeply with you and you can work them into your own everyday life. And then the other thing I have to recommend is I love audiobooks. I love books. Books are like my life. I read and I listen to a lot. Um, if anybody out there is into uh, the Sandman series uh, from Vertigo, um, you, I grew up on the comic book, so like Neil Gaiman is like, he's my jam. I love Neil Gaiman so much. He just released both part Act 1 and Act 2 of the Sandman, like audio. I wouldn't call it an audio book. It's better than an audio book. It's a whole cast of people reading the characters, like, and the cast on for both of them is out of this world. It will take you out of your current situation and literally transport you to another place because the the music and the sounds and the acting is so immersive. Um, I'm just slowly, bit by bit, enjoying pieces of the second act because I don't want to get through it too fast. I got through the first one too fast. Um, but, like, the cast is out of this world. Like, when I heard that Kat Dennings was going to be the voice of death, Ooh. I was like, what? And she's perfect. Everybody is perfect. Um, but if you need a really good escape, um, I think these like immersive audio presentations are they're like the next level in audiobooks. But unfortunately, it's only on Audible. So here's what I do. I have an Audible subscription. I save up my credits and I get everything else on the like Overdrive or the Libby app for my library. And I only really use Audible for these like limited edition audio things. It's so good. Um, and this, I hope that people don't think I. I'm like getting paid to say what I'm about to say, but uh, I have been buying perfumed oil blends and uh, now uh, magical oil blends from, well, the regular oil blends for at least 15 years. And now the magical oil blends from uh, the same company, Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab. I've been buying their stuff for, oh my God, we're talking almost 20 years now. If you want to uh, experience some magical oils that are made with great intention by a very talented oil crafter who puts her energy and love and good intention into her work. I highly recommend Twilight Alchemy Lab. They are only on Etsy, um, whereas Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab is like got their own website, but they kind of keep the two aspects of their business separate. I recommend white light oil. White light oil is like, a, it's a godsend or a goddess send or a something send, well, whatever we call it. It's literally described as a potent purification oil. Uh, you can use it to anoint your chakra points. It will help you purge of uh, morose and dark thoughts. Um, it will vigorously cleanse away day-to-day -day misery um, and help relieve stress and anxiety. And it is like, the clearer, the mind clearer. Um, I swear by white light oil. She also makes that crown of success I was talking about. I'm a big fan of uh, her healing oil. Lionheart is really great. Fiery Wall Protection is excellent. You can find it right on Etsy. And then Anathelion is another one that's really great. So that's my witchy suggestion since the other two things were not very witchy. So there you go. You got three for the price of two. Now I want you to tell me a story that you love to tell about anything at all. So my current favorite story is that uh, when I was moving a couple years ago, in the middle of all the chaos, my dog that I had had for 14 years got very sick and had to be put down. And it was very hard. Uh, I really hoped he would be there through that transition, but he was not. And it was very painful. Uh, he was my he was my familiar. He was my best bud. Um, I said, that's it. No more dogs. We're done. That's it. Really? Yeah. I said, that's it. I can't I do this. I didn't know that, that you had just decided that's all. 
Yeah, I said, so that's it. I can't do this anymore. I can't hurt like this. This pain is so intense of losing this dog. I can't. And then one day, my friend Kat sent me a picture of some dog on some rescue app and said, you have to go see this dog. And I said, he's really far away. And there, things are not good right now in the world. I just moved. I have no like stability in my head at all. I just started a new job. What the hell? I can't. But we did. And he was like, I don't know, two hours away. We went to look at him. And he was a little rescue dog who had been abused very badly. Uh, he had been starved and uh, kept outside in the cold and just hit and treated abhorrently. And I f absolutely fell in love with him. I almost couldn't leave. I wanted to leave with him. But it was a meet and greet. And that's just not how it goes. You have to, they have to do all those things before you can take a dog home. And that night at home, I had a dream that my mother came to me with the dog and handed him to me and then walked away. And so a few weeks later, I made the pilgrimage back to Perry, New York to get my dog, whose name at the time was Sushi. And I didn't really feel good about Sushi. So we brought him home and uh, he has become... He has become my familiar, and I sometimes see glimmers of my old dog in him, so I do believe that pets that pass on hang around, too. Uh, he has picked up some of his mannerisms. He even found my dog's old blanket that was hidden away, and now it's his comfort blanket, and he will not go to bed without that blanket, which was also my mother's blanket when she was going through dialysis. We had a blanket made for her, and she would use that when she was there. I don't know what is going on there, but all these things in my life connect to that blanket. And uh, this dog saved my life. He did. He saved my life. I remember when you got him. Yeah. I remember when you went to look at him. Little Sprocket. That's his new name. That's his current name, his real name. Although his nicknames are Sprockolata. Sprocklet, Mr. Man, Mr. Dog, Sir, Dude, uh, what are you what are you doing over there? Is another one of his, <laughs> his nicknames. But he, <laughs> he saved my life, Kim. He saved my life. He um moving and having to have my dad uh transition into assisted living and starting a new job and really doubting I was going to survive all that. That dog, uh Sprocket carried me through. He carried me through. So I am a big believer in the healing power of having animals around, even if it's just a hamster, like they will change your life. They will bring an energy into your life that human beings are incapable of bringing into your life. People can probably hear my dogs right now because they've run up next to the house and they're barking. Oh, I love your dogs. They are heathens. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sprocket is actually quite a heathen. I am not gonna lie. He he just heard his name, so now he has woken up and is looks staring at me because he heard his name. So well, thank you for coming on the show. It was truly a pleasure. Um, I think what you're doing is great. Um, I would I really do hope I get to see you in person again someday outside of belly dance stuff. Um <laughs> I think uh, you're probably one of my longest, long-term favorite people from Aww. when I was a dancer. Aww. I've been following your moves and everything you've been doing for years. And the algorithms of Facebook have blessed you because I see almost all of your posts when my oh, own no friends one. in the area I never see <laughs> any other shit. And the one day, one of, them, shit. one of them confronted me and said, do you just not like me anymore? I'm like, no, the algorithm Aww. see any of your crap. But I see yours. I see uh, Rob's. I see Valazon's all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. And I wish you lots of luck with the show. Um, and maybe we could get you on our show someday. I think that would be really fun. We call ourselves the Boss Witch Ladies. Like, we would love to have you on. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. It would be great. I don't know. That makes me feel weird when people think that I have something to say. <laughs> Well, you definitely do have something to say. You just uh, you just maybe haven't heard what it sounds like when it comes out of you the way we hear it. So, <laughs> the way we hear it. 
I mean, the sound of my own voice is super fucking annoying. So I think that's what it sounds like to all of us when we hear our own voices, whether they're internal or external. But you have something important to say, and you have something very important to share. I mean, in some ways, you are probably making changes in the the gaps between things where other people can't make those changes. So don't doubt yourself too much. Oh, well, hopefully. Yeah. Well, thanks. <laughs> You're very welcome. And I will, uh, I will talk to you soon. And I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. I just wanted to remind everyone to check out our sponsor, Bright Witch Brews, and to invite you to go check out some delicious teas using code YAW over at brightwitch.com for 15% off your order. And it's time for another review. This one is called Delightful and So Helpful by... I'm going to guess it's Chris Miller. It doesn't actually have any... Well... thanks (laughs) thanks <laughs> you're very welcome and i will uh i will talk to you soon and i hope you have a great rest of your sunday you too all right bye bye i just wanted to remind everyone to check out our sponsor bright witch brews and to invite you to go check out some delicious teas using code y-a-w over at brightwitch.com for 15 percent off your order And it's time for another review. This one is called Delightful and So Helpful by... I'm going to guess it's Chris Miller. It doesn't actually have any vowels. They say, I really enjoy listening to all the different stories, tips, and ideas. This is such a wonderful format, and I really look forward to new episodes. Thanks so much, Chris. I'm really glad that you find it helpful. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Your Average Witch. You can find us all around the internet on Instagram at Your Average Witch Podcast, Twitter at Average Witch Pod, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Your Average Witch Podcast, at Your Average Witch Podcast.com, and at your favorite podcast service. Want to help the podcast grow? Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You just might hear your review read at the end of the next episode. If you'd like to recommend someone for the podcast, like to be on it yourself, or if you'd like to advertise on the podcast, send an email to youraveragewitchpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the moon changes. <laughs>